Wow, it got quiet really fast. It's like the final countdown. I was ready. Well, good morning. Stand with us. It is baptism day. It's an exciting day. Let's stand and sing together. Let's start over. Start over. Now you're really ready. <laughs> Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. I tried with all my mind, but I can't just win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. I think the Savior because he healed my heart, he changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I think the Master, I think the Savior, I think God. I can't deny what I see. Got no choice but to believe my doubts are burning. Like ashes in the wind So long to my old friends Burden and bitterness You can't just keep it moving No, you're welcome here Until I walk the streets of gold I sing of how you save my soul this wayward son has found his way back home. Pick me up, turn me around, place my feet on solid ground. I think the master, I think the savior, because he healed my heart, he changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I think the master, I think the savior, I think God. Another one, I am free, I am free, I am free. That's right. He lost another one, I am free, I am free, I am Are you free? He lost another one, I am free, yeah. I am free, I am free, he lost another one. the master i think the savior because he healed my heart changed my name forever free i'm not the same i think the master i think the savior i think god
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he'll never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. got joy in chaos I got peace that makes no sense I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength cause I built my life on Jesus cause he'll never let me down he's faithful through Yeah. 
you're a solid rock. We thank you that you're a firm foundation. We thank you that we can trust you, that you're unchanging, that you remain the same, and therefore your love for us never changes. And you love us with everything inside of you right now, and that will never change because you are an unchanging God and you cannot lie. You won't lie, you cannot lie, and you love us, God. And you are a firm foundation that we can trust, that we can believe in. So we thank you for the truth of your word and that you are a relational God that wants to know us very intimately. I pray that we would open ourselves to you, God, we would open our hearts to you, that we would receive truth, we would not fight against you, Lord. We praise you, we magnify you, you are great, you are mighty, you are worthy of worship and praise for all of our days, Lord, forever and ever, you are an eternal God. So we bless your name, God. Amen. You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, this is a time that we transition every week. We continue our worship through generosity. If you're new or visiting, don't at all feel obligated to give. We're honestly just so thankful that you're here this morning. Uh, but if you do call City Walk home and you came ready to give, uh, there's two ways that you can do that. You can give in the envelopes in the lobby as you leave, uh, or you can give online by going on our app or our website and clicking on the giving tab. We're so thankful for your continued generosity that we get to be in our community and loving them in such tangible ways. Actually, tomorrow and the next day, we're going to be able to do a breakfast for the teachers at Yuba City High School and Edgewater Elementary, and we're excited to be able to love them well. So thank you for continuing to give and to be generous of your finances and time. Uh, but if you are a guest, we would love to get connected with you. Uh, the easiest way to start that is just by grabbing one of these connect cards in the seat right in front of you. There's just a couple of questions. We'd love for you to take that to the next steps table at the end of service to learn your name, shake your hand. We also have a gift for you. You can choose between a Dutch Bros or a Steelhouse gift card. But also for each one of these connect cards, we donate to a local organization in town called A Woman's Friend. So we would love to get connected. Uh, in just a minute, we're going to go ahead and we're going to dive into our next part in the God of Miracles, and Chris will come forward and share that. And then we're going to have an exciting time celebrating baptism, but we're letting the lights warm the water up so that people don't freeze. So here we go. morning, City Walk. How are we doing this morning? Morning, those of you that are watching online with us as well. Uh, this is a big month for our church. Uh, and before we dive into uh, part two of our God of Miracles series, I wanted to tell you about something that is coming at the end of this month that we have been honestly praying about and planning for for about five years. And uh, you say, well, our church is only four and a half years old. How have we been planning this for five years? Well, on the front end of our church, when we started City Walk just a few years ago, we said this, man, we want to be a church that is a church committed to multiplication. And so that means that we, man, we're excited. We want to continue to build and, and minister to Yuba City, but we also want to plant other churches in neighborhoods throughout Northern California. And so we have an opportunity. In fact, last night I got an email from the principal at Edgewater Elementary, and her words to me were, hey, you can use our facility you're in. And so in February, we're starting a new church in Edgewater to minister to that community, which should make everybody excited if you call City Walk home. 
And so in order to get ready for that, we are going to do a few interest parties in the Marysville Edgewater communities. And our very first interest party is coming up at the end of August. And so at the end of August at the old firehouse in Marysville that's owned by uh, a Bridge Coffee Company, we're going to host an interest party and going to invite the community to come have some coffee, some candy. We've got some fun things planned for the kids, but basically come and hear about a new church that's going to be starting in Yuba County. And so you're going to hear more about it. What we want to encourage you to do is every single one of us knows someone that lives in Marysville, Edgewater, Plumas Lake, and we want to encourage you to invite somebody to come to that interest party. We're actually going to have two that night, one at 5 and one at 6.30, uh, so that we'll have some times and enough space. So exciting, and you'll hear more. Be inviting, praying, and uh, we're looking forward to what God's going to do over this next few months as we prepare to launch City Walk Church in Edgewater uh, in just a few months. Uh, as we step into starting a new church, I remember it, uh, it I've started to feel some of the emotions that I felt about four and a half years ago. And for those of you that, that know me and Lori, you, you know that, man, starting a church was never like on the five-year plan, 10-year plan. Being a church planner wasn't ever anything that was on our radar until it was, until God made it clear that that's what we were supposed to do. And, and I remember, and there was a few families that helped, you know, right at the very beginning. I remember our very first interest party in August, five years ago at Steelhouse Coffee. I remember we had Brock's ice cream. We had cookie tree cookies. We had coffee. I mean, we had all the food you could ever want in this area. And I remember thinking, is anyone going to come? Like, are we just going to have a really good time together with these four or five families just eating a lot of cookies and ice cream? Or, or who, who's going to come? I remember just feeling a, a little nervous, a little scared. Uh, we, we weren't sure what was going to happen. We weren't sure if anyone was going to show. And it pushed us out of our comfort zone as, as a small group at that point. And it was in that place of uncomfortableness that we saw God do some really, really cool things. And whether you're someone who is a follower of Jesus, whether you're somebody who's investigating faith or, or not sure kind of what you believe, every single one of us can relate to having an opportunity in front of them, an opportunity that they're excited about, an opportunity that maybe they wanted to happen, but yet when the opportunity comes, we all know that feeling of, of maybe being a little bit intimidated by the opportunity or, or, or not sure kind of how things are going to work out. We might even say, man, it, it makes us a little bit afraid. And we all know what that feels like. We would all probably also say that, man, we love stories of people who step out of their comfort zone and, and, and make a huge impact. We cheer those stories on. Until we find ourselves the person with the door in front of us. And it's like, oh, I love it when I watch you step through that door. But when it's my turn to take a step through that door, it's my turn to, to do the hard thing or, or step out in faith in some area of my life. Man, that's when it gets a little bit nerve-wracking because we're not sure what to do. Our reputation's on the line. We don't want to fail. And so we find ourselves a little bit intimidated by opportunities. And this morning, we're going to actually look at a guy in the scriptures who felt that exact tension. He's a guy who literally had the opportunity to change the direction of an entire country. But when that opportunity came to him, frankly, he didn't want it. He, he didn't want to step into the opportunity. He, he knew it was going to be hard. And so though it was an opportunity to literally change the direction of an entire nation forever... This guy that you've heard of, whether you grew up in church or not, Moses, wasn't quite sure that he wanted to step into it. He knew it would be hard, and frankly, he didn't want it to be hard. He didn't want to do it. And like I said, you've, you've heard of Moses. Whether you grew up in church or not, you've probably heard of him. And to understand the story of Moses that we're going to look at this morning, 
you really have to understand the story of a guy by the name of Joseph, another historical figure who also saw God do some really miraculous things in his life. So Joseph lived about four to 500 years before Moses. Joseph was a Jewish young man who, like I said, saw God do some crazy miracles in his own life to the point where he's about 30 years old and he finds himself the prime minister of Egypt. So Jewish boy, 30 years old, becomes the prime minister of Egypt. It's a long story. You should read it because God did some cool stuff to make that happen. But he finds himself in this situation where he's prime minister of, of a very powerful country. And his first kind of big assignment as prime minister is he is supposed to prepare the country and prepare the people for what is coming, a famine that's going to last seven years. And he kills it. He, he does an incredible job preparing the country for this famine and, and preparing the country to survive this famine. He does a great job. Well, while this famine is going on and he's doing a great job taking care of these people and taking care of his country, he also wants to take care of his own family. And so he invites his own family, about 70 people at this point, to move from where they were. They're a Jewish family and he wants to move them and he moves them to Egypt so he can kind of take care of his own family as well. And that's what he does. And his family has several brothers. His family, like I said, is about 70 people all together. Man, they flourish in Egypt. A few years pass, and Joseph and his generation kind of go off the scene. And that people that started with 70 become thousands and hundreds of thousands. And, and, and it becomes a huge nation that's living in Egypt that's not Egyptians. And after a few generations pass, and now the king of Egypt doesn't remember who Joseph is. Joseph doesn't mean anything to him. He doesn't owe Joseph anything. He starts to look at this Jewish nation that's in Egypt, and he starts to see them as a threat. And he starts to think, man, if they continue to grow and they continue to get stronger, man, there's going to come a day where they're going to take over and we're going to work for them. And so he decided he was going to do everything he could to hinder the Jewish nation, to stop them, to, to make it really hard for them. And so he did. Exodus chapter 1, it says this. Verse 12, it says, the more they oppressed them, the more this king of Egypt tried to make it hard for the Jewish nation, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. So this king of Egypt, he's like, well, that didn't work. We tried to work them hard. We tried to make their, their life a little tough and thought that would kind of slow them down. And well, that didn't work. And so he says, you know what? I got I to take it to another level. Let me go to plan B. And he says this, he finds the midwives, the ladies that deliver all the Jewish kids. And he, and he commands these midwives, hey, when you're delivering these Jewish children, if it's a girl, let it live. If it's a boy, make sure it's not alive. Pretty, I mean, that's like terrible. And, and, and so these midwives, these midwives, they actually fear God. And so they didn't do what the king said. It says this in verse 17. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had told them. They let the boys live. And so now Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, he's getting more desperate. He's, he's tried to work the people hard and kind of make their life tough, and maybe that'll slow them down. That didn't work. Well, now let's take it up a notch, and let's just try to have the people that deliver the babies just kind of kill off the boys. So eventually, you know, there's... You need a boy and a girl to have more kids, so that'll kind of slow it down in the future. Well, that didn't work, and so he goes to a whole nother level, and he just says this. He's not even trying to hide it anymore. He, he tells his people, he tells kind of all the Egyptians, hey, when you see a little baby that's a, a, a Jewish boy, just throw him in the Nile River. Let's just get rid of all the little baby boys. And so it's in this context which is, man, a, a tough place, especially if you're a Jewish baby boy. T tough place to kind of come into the world. It's in this context that we're introduced to Moses' parents, a young Jewish couple 
who, who makes a courageous decision that will literally change the history of their nation. And, and so this young Jewish couple, it says this in Exodus chapter 2, verse 1, it says this. Now a man from the, the family of Levi married a Levite woman. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. I read that and I think, well, what if he wasn't beautiful? Would she have been like, nah, throw him in the Nile. We we don't want him. But but I I guess he looked cute. So she's like, no, we're going to try to keep this one around. And and so in that, and, and you moms and dads that have had little ones, like that in itself is a miracle. Like, Small house, small community, keeping a baby boy quiet for three months without Benadryl. That's a toughie. That's a toughie. And and, and so she did. She tries to hide this baby and kind of keep him quiet so that he he lives. But after three months, and it's like getting tough to keep this guy quiet, she has to come up with another plan. And it says this in verse 3, but when she could no longer hide him, She got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with asphalt and pitch. She placed the child in it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. Then his sister stood at a distance in order to see what would happen to him. So now you have little Moses, who's not as little as he was a few months ago. He's, man, rambunctious, just being a boy, a little baby boy, what a baby boy does. They realize, you know what, this is getting hard to hide him. And so mama makes a basket up and she, you know, puts the the baby in the basket and puts it in the Nile River. And honestly, when I get to heaven, I love to ask, like, what was the plan with that? Like, he's in the Nile River. What were you hoping happened? Did you know that that Pharaoh's daughter was going to be bathing in that area? Was that kind of your plan all along? Because that's what happens. This little baby boy is in this basket and... And Pharaoh's daughter happens to be in the water near where this baby is. And here's a baby crying. And so she goes and, and, and opens up the basket and looks down. And this beautiful baby boy's in there. And her heart goes out to him, even though he's a Jewish boy. And her dad's the one that said to kill all the Jewish boys. And so she decides that she's basically going to adopt this little boy. And, and right about that time, Moses' sister, who's just off in the distance kind of watching all this happen, comes up to Pharaoh's daughter and says, hey, would you like me to find someone to kind of nurse him and kind of take care of him and, and maybe raise him for the first few years till like all the, the tough stuff he's potty trained, all that stuff's taken care of, and then, then we'll actually deliver him to you? And, and Pharaoh's daughter's like, oh, that's a great, in fact, I'll pay that person. So... Uh, Moses' sister goes and gets Moses' real mom and says, hey, you want to get paid to take care of your own kid? Sure. And and that's what happens. And and then Moses is delivered to the princess. And and after he's kind of weaned and after he spends time at his own home being kind of raised those first few years with his mom, he's taken to really the center of power. He's taken and for the first 40 years of his life, he's raised next to all the riches and resources and education and power and architecture and the art. I mean, all this beauty and power and riches, he's right in the middle of it. He's raised, he gets all the, the best training and all the, everything's going for him. But at the age of 40, Moses still, he understands all along that he, he lives with this basically stepmom, but he knows I'm a Jewish guy. This isn't my real life. Those people who are being oppressed, the Israelites, the Jewish nation, those are my people. And at the age of 40, he's, he's out and he sees an Egyptian beating a Jewish worker. And it says this in, in Exodus chapter 2, verse 12, it says, looking all around and seeing no one, He struck the Egyptian dead and hid him in the sand. And so there was something inside of Moses 
There was a deliverer, a I want to make it better for my people. Even as he's in the middle of, of all the riches and all the power, he, there was something in him that knew that he was a Jewish person and he had a heart for those people and he was burdened by their slavery. And when he saw somebody being beaten, he couldn't take it. He couldn't handle it. And so he, man, he went on and he killed this Egyptian and he buried the body. And he probably thought, well, there's a lot of sand in Egypt. They're probably never going to find this body. I'm probably good. But then just very, you know, what wasn't long and, and people found out. People found out that Moses had killed an Egyptian. And so now Moses is afraid of Pharaoh. He knows he's, his life is on the line. And so he flees to the desert. And over the next 40 years... Moses, he gets married, he has children, he works as a shepherd in the desert, man, far away from Egypt. His life couldn't look more different than what it looked like the first 40 years of his life. I mean, every day for Moses is taking care of his father-in-law's sheep. Every day is probably very predictable. He probably does the same thing in the same way every single day. It's been 40 years. Yeah, I'm sure there's a distant memory of Egypt. There's a distant memory of what went on there. But man, his life is so much different. Until one day, on one of those predictable days that look like every other day, God spoke to Moses in the middle of the desert. And here's what God said to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. Verse 9, it says, this is God speaking. So because the Israelites cry for help has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them, therefore go, I am sending you to Pharaoh that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Hey, Moses, I haven't forgotten I haven't closed my ears to the, the cries of the Jewish people. I know you've been far away from it for the last 40 years, but I haven't been. I've been right in the middle of it. I've heard their cries, and I've chosen you to go back and deliver them. I've chosen you to go back to Pharaoh and, and be my spokesperson to, to lead the people out of Egypt. And, and Moses, at that point, he doesn't run home right away and pack his bags and tell his wife, hey, God's called me. I'm, I'm going to head to a, do a little business trip real quick. No, instead, Moses, he whines a little bit. He, he tells God all the reasons that his plan isn't a good idea. He reminds God of all the, the areas in Moses' life that he's insecure about, all the things that he's not good at. And, and he kind of does anything he can to kind of like, God, isn't there somebody else? God, don't you know how bad I am at this or how bad I am at that? Or I'm, your, I'm not your guy, God. And God, in that moment, reminded Moses that the success of this assignment had nothing to do with Moses' abilities, but his obedience. See, and, and Moses found this out. When God calls you to an assignment, he's putting his reputation on the line. When God was calling Moses to this assignment, he wasn't calling Moses to this assignment and putting Moses' reputation on the line, he was putting his reputation on the line. And the second thing that, that Moses found out eventually is that, that God was not trusting in, in his ability. He, he is not trusting in your ability, but his. God wasn't like, you know what, you're the most qualified person, and so you know what, I'm putting all my eggs in your basket, and I really hope this thing works out. No, God wasn't trusting in Moses' ability for success. God was trusting in Moses' obedience, his faithfulness. It was all about God's ability, not Moses'. And I think sometimes when, when we're called to step into something, I think we think, oh, what if it doesn't go well? What if, what if I, I, don't, I don't do a good job? What if I fail? God's like, it's, it's not about your reputation. It's about your obedience. But God, I, I don't have this, or I can't do that, or you know what, I, I don't do this well, or there's somebody else way more qualified. And God's like, oh, you think this is about your ability? 
Oh, actually, this, has had no, this never has had anything to do with your ability. You can't even breathe without me. It isn't up to your ability. This is about me working through a vessel that's willing to be used. It's about my ability. And so God, in this middle of the desert, he's speaking to Moses, and he kind of just reminds him of who he is. And Moses, after God patiently reminds Moses of who he is and how he has uniquely prepared him for this moment, Moses reluctantly obeys. And it says this. Later, in verse uh, Exodus chapter 5, later Moses and Aaron, Aaron is Moses' brother, they, they get to Egypt, they went in and said to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. The God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. So Moses and Aaron, they get to, you know, get there to the palace and all right, our turn. It's time to go in to see the wizard or whatever, you know, kind of like, or not just like Wizard of Oz. It's our turn to go in and we're kind of nervous. They go in and like, hey, uh, God told us, this is, this is from God. Don't be mad at us. This is from God. God tells us that you are supposed to let this group of people that started about set with about 70 people that now is hundreds of thousands of people, you're supposed to just let them go. And here's what Pharaoh said. He says, but Pharaoh responded, okay, Ah, no sweat. Enjoy enjoy the journey. Let's go ahead. No, that's not what Pharaoh did. (laughs) Pharaoh, here's how he responded. He said, who is the Lord that I should obey him by letting Israel go? Like, like, yeah, this God might mean something to you, but who's this God? I don't care anything about this God. I don't know the Lord. And besides, I will not let Israel go. I could care less who your Lord is. He doesn't mean anything to me. I ain't letting y'all go. That's bad English. I know, but that, <laughs> he's like, no, you're not going anywhere. Go do something, but you're not going anywhere. You're staying here. And, and at this moment, if you read through the narrative, and I'd encourage you, it's a lot of the book of Exodus, you find out that Moses, is just, he's kind of flustered. He, he's kind of, and we would probably be flustered too. He was kind of flustered. He's like, man, in his mind, he's like, God, you, you mean this isn't going to be easy? You, you mean it's, I, I'm going to go there and, and tell him to let us go, and he's not just going to roll out the red carpet and let us go? It, God, I, this isn't the way I thought it was supposed to work out. I, I had faith, and I did what I was supposed to do. But here's what Moses learned really quickly. Faith is not the starting line. It is the whole journey. See, faith isn't, oh, I made the decision on the front end. I'm going to make that hard decision. No, no, no. Tomorrow you have to continue to be faithful. See, faith, it's not just the starting line. It is the starting line, but it's more than just the starting line. It's the whole journey. See, we think once we say yes, sometimes we think, oh, I said yes. I did the hard thing. It's going to be all cake and roses. God's like, actually, it might get a little harder, actually. And so, yeah, you you had to believe me on the front end of this thing, but you actually have to trust me all the way through it, too. That's part of this whole thing of becoming more like Jesus. And and, and so over this next, and and for us, it's a few verses, but it's over a time period after Pharaoh has basically told Moses, hey, not letting them go. God isn't like, well, man, didn't see that one coming. Let's get the Holy Spirit and Jesus together up here. Let's see if we can come up with a plan B. No, God knew this was going to happen all along. He had this planned. God had a plan to, he was going to show his power in a unique way that honestly, as you read the Bible, he had not shown his power in this way in any other parts of the Bible up to this point, in any parts of the narrative. But this was something very unique and God showed up in a crazy way. And so over the next few days and weeks, God displays his power by sending multiple plagues on the Egyptian people. He he turns the water into blood. He sends frogs. He sends lice. He sends hail. He sends locusts. He sends darkness. I mean, just on and on and 
And, and about the time it would get really tough and Pharaoh would call Moses, all right, I relent. Okay, you can, let, well, you can go, 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 do, just make God stop. And then God would stop and the, the lice would leave or the frogs would all die. And, but then Pharaoh would be like, all right, it's a little easier now. So nope, you can't go. I'm, I'm going back on my word. And this happened over and over and over again until the very last and most devastating plague, the death of every firstborn. In Egypt and it was after that final plague and it, the, the, this most devastating fla- plague that that hit Pharaoh very closely as it did all the families that Pharaoh told Moses after hundreds of years of slavery you are free to go and he, and he meant it this time he, he didn't quickly turn around and no 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 he, he, go. In fact, in fact, we want to like get out of here. Go. In fact, all, a lot of the uh, Egyptian neighbors actually gave riches, gave a lot of their stuff. So, man, the, the Jewish people, they left. And, man, they left and they plundered Egypt of a lot of their riches as they went. And so imagine this feeling like you as, an, or as a Jewish person, you don't remember a day you haven't been enslaved. Your grandpa doesn't remember a day that you weren't enslaved. Your great, great, great grandpa. I mean, it's been hundreds of years. And finally, someone says to you and the hundreds of thousands in your nation, you are free to go. Imagine what that must have felt like. Imagine the emotions. They they probably thought, man, is this a dream? This can't be real. It was probably like the, the ultimate deep breath. Like the ultimate feeling of relief and hope. And so they left Egypt and they began this journey to a land that God had promised them hundreds of years earlier. A land that's just known as the promised land. And as they're getting into the journey, not just a few days into the journey, they come and they begin to camp. They camp right in front of the Red Sea. And it's only been a little while since they left. And, and after they left, at first, it, a Pharaoh was like, hey, we want you out of here. Get out of here. You're causing a lot of problems. But after they all cleared out, Pharaoh began to realize, I just let my entire workforce go. And he regretted it. And so what he does is after they're all gone and now they're probably taking a deep breath, a sigh of relief right there in front of the Red Sea. Pharaoh says, we're going back after him. And he takes his army and 600 chariots to chase down and bring back the entire Jewish nation. And so you can imagine the Red Sea is in front of you. You look back and the Egyptian army is barreling down behind you. And they're coming to get you. And here's what Exodus chapter 14 says. It says, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and they were, and there were the Egyptians coming after them. The Israelites were terrified and cried out to the Lord for help. I mean, you talk about a mood swing from we're free, hope, deep breath to now it's like, what in the world's going on? The Egyptian army's coming after us. It says this in verse 11, they said to Moses, is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you in Egypt? Leave us alone so that we may serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Basically, they're they're giving the Moses the, I knew this was going to happen talk. We told you. I knew this was too good to be true. Why didn't you just leave us alone? Slavery was more comfortable than trusting God. Why did you bring us out? And before we get on the Jewish people too much, a lot of us have, have and may even now be living in the same way. And and here's what I mean. We believe the lie that slavery is better than trusting God and walking the path he has for us. 
we are used to slavery. Slavery is comfortable to us. Stepping out of our comfort zone and trusting God and changing is tough. And so we, we find ourselves, and we would never say it this way, but we find ourselves comfortable in slavery. We're, we're in slavery to pornography because it's better and in our minds easier than doing what we'd have to do to be pure. We're, we're in slavery to greed because it's better and in our minds easier than trusting God with our finances and actually being generous. We're in slavery to fear because it's better than what we would have to do to get peace. And again, we would never say it this way. We would never say that. But we live unwilling to move out of our comfort zone for freedom. And, and, and that's where these people were. They, they were. All they knew was slavery. And so this idea of trusting God for a much better path and, and for God's way that, that wasn't what they knew and they weren't comfortable with, they would much rather in their minds go back to being enslaved than actually trusting God and walking the path that God had for them. And yet Moses in this moment, he's, he's grown as a leader at this point. He doesn't feed kind of that, that mindset. He doesn't agree with them. Here's what Moses says in verse 13. It says, but Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm. Why? How can we stand firm in, when, when the army's coming and the Red Sea's in front of us? How do we do that? And he says this, see the Lord's salvation that he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you must be quiet. See, if this was on the Israelites, if this was on their ability, if this was on them, they should be afraid. But it was never on them. It was never based on their ability. It was never based on their plan. It was never based on their ingenuity. It was always based on the fact that the Lord had called them and he would fight for them. He was their salvation. And so because of that, they could stand in the midst of what looked like an impossible situation and they could stand quietly and firmly and trust God and not be a mess. It says this in verse 21. It says, after Moses has called them to trust God, God does what seems impossible. It says, verse 21, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove back, drove the sea back with a powerful east wind all that night and turned the sea into dry land. So the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground. With the waters like a wall to them on their right and their left. So Moses parts the waters. I mean, God parted them, but, but he used Moses. And, and again, if, if we, when we get to heaven, if we can like, if there's like a theater there and we can watch some of the old, like, can I watch this one? I want to see how this really looked. But it says that, that the water parted and they were, there was a wall of water on the right, on the left. And they walked across, not in muddy, on dry ground. The entire nation. And if you continue to read through this, you find that also God put a cloud behind them so that, that he protected them from the Egyptians. And then as, as they're kind of getting across the, and I always thought as a little kid, could they like reach in and just grab a fish? That was what I thought. I remember as a little kid, oh, that'd be kind of cool. Just grab a fish, swim in by. Uh, but, but they walk across and then the Egyptians, because they don't trust God. They're like, man, why not? Why not? It looks like it's pretty easy for them. They say, all right, well, they got in. They went across. So let's just kind of follow them. Let's go get them. And instead of a smooth path, God caused the Egyptian army to be confused He caused their chariots to swerve, and it was just tough. And then 
as the Egyptian army is in the middle of the sea on this ground that the Israelites have just recently walked across. The scriptures tell us that God just released the waters back onto them and that every single person in the Egyptian army was killed in this event. It says this in verse 30. That day the Lord saved Israel from the power of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Like that, that would just be, I mean, that'd be weird. That'd be tough. Like you're across and all of a sudden you see these people that you've been afraid of washing up on the shore. I mean, this would have been, have been crazy. And it says this, verse 31. When Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, you think? And believed in him and in his servant Moses. We're in. We believe. Yes. What do you want us to do, God? We are in. What do you want us to do, Moses? We will go. And that lasted for about a, a, you know, a minute for them. And then they got complained again down the road. We'll re maybe read about that later. But, but they, after they, I mean, wouldn't you? Like, what do you want me to do, God? I'm in. I, I just saw something that no one in the history of the world has ever seen and will ever see again. A powerful way that you worked. I'm in. And, and if you, whether you're watching online or you're here this morning, if you grew up in church, you've probably heard about this story. You've probably heard about some of the miracles that, that happened in Moses' life. If you didn't grow up in church, or maybe you're here and you're kind of investigating faith, for you, some of the miracles that happened in Moses' life, you may have not, this might be the first time you've ever heard of them. But, but no matter where you find yourself as it relates to the miracles uh, that happened in Moses' life or the miracles that happened in Abraham's life, which we talked about last week, whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, the miracles in Moses and the miracles in Abraham's life remind us that God sees, that God loves, and that God is for us. When we looked at Abraham last week and now we look into Moses' life and some of the miracles, it reminds us that God sees us when we think he's not around. When we think, is God, does God even care? God sees. It reminds us that not only does God see, but God loves us. And not only that, but God is us. And you see that all throughout the story of the miracles in Moses and Abraham's life. And, and, and as we think of Moses and, and some of these truths that, that kind of come out in this story, it, it leads me to, to two questions that I think are worth asking. They're two very personal questions that I think from the story of Moses are, are worth asking and con contemplating. And here's the first question. Have I become comfortable with slavery in my life? This is just, just a personal question. Like, ha have I become kind of comfortable with my addiction, with my greed, with lust, with gluttony, with fear? And I mean, feel, have I just, is it just the way it is? And it would just be too hard to change anything. Have I just become comfortable? in slavery. And then the second question is, what is God calling me to do that will lead to freedom? Because if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus didn't come so you could be shackled. He actually came to earth to tear the shackles off. And so if you are enslaved by something, that's not what God wants for you. He actually came so you wouldn't have to be. So there's got to be a step. There's got to be something that, that, that you, you could do or say or move towards that's just one step that would help you be released from the slavery you've become comfortable with. I mean, because here's, ha here's what happens. When we decide to follow Jesus, if you've made that choice, if you've made the decision to believe that you have disobeyed God and that you're in need of a Savior... 
and you've believed that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave for you, and, and you've put your faith in that, if you've done that, then the chains of slavery have been broken in your life. But sometimes, though we are free, we choose not to believe that God's way is best, and we begin to act like we're enslaved when we're not. And so if that's you, and, and maybe you're dealing with something like that, man, what, what is God calling you to do that will lead you to freedom? And for some, if you're watching online or you're here this morning, your decision, you, you might be, you know what, I'm not a follower of Jesus. And so for you, the decision is, man, today, start a relationship with God. Tell God that, God, I, I admit that I've disobeyed you. I admit that I've sinned. I've done things my way. But I believe that Jesus came and died on the cross to pay for my sin. He was put in a grave. He rose from the grave. And I want a relationship with him. Today, if you don't have a relationship with God, you can make that decision right where you're at. If you're online or you're here this morning, just tell God. But maybe you've already made that decision, and a lot of us have. And so for you, there's got to be a step. Maybe you are enslaved to people-pleasing. Maybe you're enslaved to gossip. Maybe you're enslaved to pornography. Maybe you're enslaved to anger. There's got to be a step. And one step might just be being honest about it and telling someone, hey, I am struggling with this. And admitting, I am enslaved to this. I need accountability. I need help. I need someone to encourage me. It, it might be turning away from something in your life that is it's just part of that enslavement. And, and for you, you know, until I get away from this, I'm going to stay enslaved. And so it literally may be a turning away where I say, I'm going to turn from this and I'm going to turn to this, to God. I don't know what it is for you, but the power to walk in freedom is available because of what Jesus did. And this morning, as we close out this part of our service, uh, a few times a year, we take an opportunity to remember what Jesus did. We remember what he did that allows us to have freedom by taking communion. And on your way in, and if you didn't happen to do that, uh, you can in a, few, in a minute or two, I'm going to give you an opportunity. On your way in, you probably picked up a little thing like this with juice and a little wafer. And in just a second, I'm going to give you a chance to pray. And, and if you haven't picked up one of those, you can go pick one of these up. But the reason that we take communion, we do it for a few reasons. One is it's something that Jesus modeled. Jesus, before he died, he said, hey... This is, this is something that I want you to do to remember the sacrifice that I'm going to give for you. And this was just a few days before he actually died on the cross. He, he was with his guys and he said, hey, uh, we're going to do this together now. We're going to take this, this juice and this bread. And, and, and after I'm done with this, and they didn't even know what was coming, I'm going to make a huge sacrifice. I'm going to give my life. But, but after I'm gone, I want you to continue to do this communion ceremony. And it will help you remember that I gave my life for you, that I shed my blood for you. And so the, the wafer represents Jesus' body. It represents Jesus' body that was beaten and broken for us. The juice represents his blood. Again, on that cross, he shed his blood, not for his own sin, but for ours. And so we take the wafer, we take the juice as a way to just tangibly try to help ourselves remember what Jesus did. And the, the only, there's, there's two requirements that the scripture gives us for taking communion. The first requirement is that you have a relationship with God. So if there's been a time in your life where you have made the decision to follow Jesus, to believe that he died and rose for you and and put your faith in that. That's one of the requirements the scripture gives us. And then the second requirement is this. The scriptures tell us that, hey, before you take communion, you should take a, a, some time and examine yourself. 
And just examine, is there, man, is there some places in my life right now where there's sin in my life? Is there some places in my life where I'm kind of going a direction that's not God's best? And I just need to take that opportunity to tell God, God, I'm wrong and to turn from that. And so what we're going to do here in just a second is we're going to take just a couple minutes right where you're at. And you just personally take some time, examine your heart. And if there's something you need to do to get right with God, it's your opportunity to do that. While we're praying and Julia's playing for us, if you haven't had an opportunity to pick up your communion, you can quietly go do that. And then I'm going to get up here in just a couple minutes and we will take communion together. So let's take this opportunity to examine ourselves before the Lord. First Corinthians 11 says this, The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember Christ's broken body as we eat the wafer. same passage it says this says in the same way also he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me let's remember the blood that Jesus shed for us as we drink the juice let's pray Lord, I thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us. I pray that even as we're 2,000 years away from when you made that sacrifice, Lord, I pray that we would never lose sight of it, that we would never take it for granted, but that we would live each day thankful, that we would live each day from a spirit of gratefulness for the fact that God sent his son to earth and that his son Jesus took our place on the cross. God, I pray that we would never forget what you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today, uh, our service is a little bit longer than normal because we're doing communion and we're also celebrating something that we love to celebrate and honestly there's nothing we love to celebrate more at city walk than baptism and and baptism for those of you that may be new to faith or you're still investigating faith is a is a way that we show the world that we're a follower of jesus the illustration i like to use is the illustration of a wedding ring so i wear this wedding ring this wedding ring doesn't make me married but it shows you that I'm married. I could take this wedding ring off. I could still be married with or without this wedding ring. This wedding ring is just a symbol to the world that I'm married. Same reason many of you are wearing a wedding ring, because it shows the world that you're married. 
Baptism doesn't save you. It doesn't give you a relationship with God. It's simply a way for you to tell the world that you have a relationship with Jesus, that you are following him. It's going public with a private decision that you've made. And so today we get a chance to celebrate with two families as two people get baptized. So I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Steve. Well, thank you. Today we get to see two. First it will be Mason Kaufman. And his father, Matt, is going to be given the privilege to baptize him in just a minute. Then we'll have Brill West. And her dad, uh, Doug, is going to be baptizing her. So uh, we're excited about this. And they'll be reading a testimony just before uh, we dunk them. So uh, hold on to your hats. <laughs> Already has the nose covered. I promise there's water in there. Right, I'm going to read it for him. Uh, I was taught about sin and grace, but I didn't understand until I sinned and asked God for help on my own. My mom and dad believe in Jesus and taught me about him from the day I was born. I have read and heard the gospel, and I felt it was true in my heart. I know I have the Holy Spirit inside me, which helps me become more like Jesus. I want to be more kind, helpful, and to share his love. I was dedicated with the verse Psalm 71.3, but our family has been memorizing John 3.30. He must become greater, I must become less. I want what God wants. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. This is Brill West and her dad, Doug. It is hard for me to share what my life was like and what circumstances led to me receiving Christ as my Savior when I was seven years old because I can't remember. However, what I can share is how, as I have grown into adulthood, I have also grown into a deeper, stronger relationship with Christ. College became a turning point in my spiritual walk with God. Away from family, I had to make the conscious decision to anchor my faith and develop a deeper relationship with God. Since venturing out on my own, my relationship with Christ has only grown. Not only has it opened so many doors for me, but I am confident in my faith. I walk boldly every day knowing that God has my back and is always by my side. I have wanted to get baptized for some time now, and I finally feel confident enough in my growth and relationship with Christ to do it. One verse that I always come back to in times of struggle and worry, and one which I base my salvation on, is 2 Timothy 4.17. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. Having known you all of your life, it's my pleasure to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Thank you. Awesome. So we're going to celebrate and continue to celebrate. Why don't you stand with us? Let's sing such an awesome God together.
can go ahead and have a seat. Uh, there's nothing quite like celebrating baptism and seeing kids and adults go public with their faith. Uh, so we've had a great morning this morning, but we have a couple of ways for you to connect that we want to make sure that you're aware of before you go this morning. And so the first is, we mentioned it earlier, we're doing a breakfast for Yuba City High School and Edgewater Elementary. And on top of loving on them well with a good meal before they go into a day of meetings, we also want to encourage them. So we have a table set out. Some of you may have already done it, but there are thank you cards. So if you would just take a minute
minute and write a note of encouragement. Teaching is a hard job and it doesn't stop all year long. So we want to make sure that we are encouraging them so that they're equipped for the year ahead of them. So take a second just to write a note to a teacher at a high school or elementary school. Uh, and then also tomorrow coming up is the table. The table is our gathering for the women of Yuba Sutter. So we want to make sure that you are ready for that. If you are a woman between the ages of 17 and 117, this is for you. Uh, Julie's going to be leading us through Psalm 37 tomorrow. Uh, we're going to have some good food. We have a bunch of, it's going to be dip nights, so we have a bunch of delicious dips. And it's just a really great way to build connections. I know that we are all hungry for meaningful relationships. This is just a great environment for you to connect with women who are ahead of you and behind you and right next to you in a season of life. So if you haven't already, make plans for tomorrow at 7 o'clock. And as always, if you forget the time or the location of something like this, it's always in the app if you open up the app and go into announcements. And then the last thing is next week, we're going to have intro to City Walk right after service. So if you've been, if you're new or you've been here for a little bit and you're looking to get deeper connected to City Walk or learn more information about our history, how we started, or just have some time to ask questions, this is for you. So make plans for next Sunday after service. If you have any questions or there's any way we, we can serve you or you filled out one of those Next Steps cards, we'd love to see you at the Next Steps table. Otherwise, we hope you have a great week.